session on the interaction between mobile phones and the transport of mobile phones. I know that she's worked in like the other half of the country that I work in. I work in the north of Ghana, which is like a savannah area in the agriculture, and she's worked a lot in the south of Ghana, which I'm in trouble But we were the only people who were interested in this, so we end up in the second half of this session, which is, which is fine anyway. Um, so, I think Gina's proposing actually that mobile phones can help to alleviate some of the transport burden that people have in um, sub-Saharan Africa. And um, this is not actually my main area of research. I just work mostly on like the, the agriculture that people do and the technology that they use in agriculture, donkey carts and stuff like that, and bicycles happens to be part of that. But um, I, I saw the abstract at the board and I started thinking a lot about the mobile phone use that I observed throughout my research. And I really actually speaking to me. So what I want to present today is just really some ethnographic reflections, just some illustrations um, of more how uh, mobile phones just interact with transport in different ways actually. I don't really, I, I'm going to end up saying more that they promote innovation rather than that they have an effect on transport in one direction or the other. The, um, the current idea about um, how mobile phones are going to work in African agriculture at the moment is like quite a strong policy discourse about how phones are useful because they help farmers to link to the markets. So I've definitely observed this happening. Um, this is the village where I did most of my research on uh, agriculture and donkey carts. And you can see that tomato farmers in the top left hand corner um, selling their tomatoes to some marketers who they called on the phone and asked to come to the village. And the other alternative is for those guys to take, like, um, see that metal basin on the floor there, to take that on their bicycle and cycle to another town in, like 12 kilometers away and just sell that one. Whereas now they can sell a whole crate of tomatoes to the guy with the green truck, which is quite a good advantage for those of them who have mobile phones. However, some of them who don't manage to sell all their tomatoes still do have to cycle 12 miles to the next town. Um, it's, that's something that does work for other um, agricultural collectors and producers as well. So people who sell, um, who go to the bush and collect shear nuts, these are shear nuts which are pretty valuable and it's something that women mostly do in northern Ghana. They, they also have a, a booming trade actually in northern Ghana. There's a lot of market agents who come to villages to buy these shear nuts. Women are less likely to have phones, so they more have to rely on the market woman's whim. So if the market lady comes to the village to buy the shear nuts, that's great, but if they don't, then you have to still walk all the way to that market. And this um, mode of using mobiles to get into the market is less effective for people like the kids on the right, who are just going around selling um, cooked food, and then people who um, collect bush products like uh, firewood or like some type of indigenous meat and take them to the market. There aren't really any marketers for that. So they are still stuck to the old fashioned methods of um, just waiting for someone to go along or walking the long way in order to sell their stuff. The other side of agriculture is production. Um, marketing is like, really strongly emphasised in the current policy discourse, but production has to come from somewhere. And this is what most of my work has focused on, specifically people like this farmer who uses his bicycle to carry compost to the field these days who are just carrying compost and fertilizers to the field when they're heading. Mobile phones can't really help much there until a market gets involved as well. Again, like a market for something like this, this donkey car. So I did research on this a few years back and then people can use the phone to contact the guy with the donkey car to come and cart the compost to the field. So I seem to observe like okay technology and communication technology gets involved, the market gets involved and everything goes uh, forwards. This is like the kind of conventional policy discourse. And it, it draws on this really old model of innovation adoption, like from way back in the 60s, like the conventional idea um, is that, yeah, there are some people in society who are innovators and like, they adopt technology. They can have a mobile phone and then most people get to that stage and then there are some people who are, who are called laggards, like kind of a derogatory term uh, implying that they they, they can't use technology very well, they're left behind and they, they eventually catch up, they get a mobile phone or a donkey cart and then they're able to make money. Um, in the 70s then, people who interpreted this and said, okay, well actually maybe it's not about innovation, it's about just how wealthy people 
um, the wealthiest people have a phone, then they can get into the market, and so that, and then these laggards are actually just poorer people. So that was the critique of this model. And it's quite easy to apply those interpretations to this situation. But through my observations in Ghana, I started to think about it in a bit more of a nuanced way. And I began to think about um, journeys that people don't do for like agricultural production or marketing, but maybe for social reasons. And what's the interaction of mobile phones and technology with that? It's a bit more difficult to figure out. There are certain journeys that can't be replaced by a mobile phone. Um, one of the journeys, um, the, the charging of my title, is um, if you have a mobile phone, the situation that happens in the village where I've been working in, if you have a phone and there's no electricity, you actually have to make an extra journey to the town or wherever there is electricity to charge the thing. So rather than preventing travel, for some people it can cause a journey. That's not necessarily a bad thing though. Some people actually enjoy making, having the excuse, oh, I'm going to charge my phone, so I'll just ride my bike to my friend's house in the town and charge the phone there, hang out with them for a few hours and come back. Or combining this with a trip to the market, which is the main social event of the week for most people in my village. So this is a bit of a nuanced relationship. It could be a pain to charge your phone on Sundays, but actually quite a good excuse on those days. There are some other social events like where phones can't replace. This was a guy getting Skid, we call it skid, or enthroned as a chief, guy in the white hat, and then um, there's no way you can just call him up and say, like, oh, I'm, not, I'm not coming to the chief this evening, you know, have a good one. So these are the types of um, events where personal presence is absolutely necessary, and phones can't go really go anywhere near that. Mm. However, another thing that's interesting in this picture is it illustrates another interaction of like phones and social journeys. Here, when you see someone's like, there's loads of phone numbers written on the wall. And what people tend to do, it's really common for you to go to someone's house in northern Ghana and see their phone number written somewhere on their house, like on their wall. And the idea is, um, if the guy has a phone, if you get to his house, um, you can flash it. So just give him a one a missed call, and then he'll know that you're waiting at his door. If you have a phone, you do call the call in advance. Um, vice versa, if um, if you got to someone's house and they don't have a phone, um, you may write your phone number then on the door. It's like, I was here, give me, a, give me a flash, so I'll come back, kind of thing. It made me think about how the quality of journeys can change. It's not like quantitatively changing journeys. Um, if you call someone up and say, shall I come or shall I not come? And they can say yes or no, but this is like making it a more worthwhile journey if I'm not calling back. So it's like an interaction, but not really a quantitative relationship. That um, idea of flashing someone, that um, is an innovation and it's not something that's like an external innovation that's been adopted by the farmers. I saw it as an innovation that's been, yeah, that people made themselves. And if, if we look at that idea again of like people adopting innovation from outside, it makes me think about now um, the 80s and 90s when people had the idea that no, actually farmers themselves actually innovate. This was an idea put out more in the context of like agricultural technologies rather than communication technologies. So farmers themselves do innovate. And I see that as an innovation that's come from poorer people, um, helping them maybe to empower themselves in the language of development. Yeah. An idea that came after that um, was not that the, uh, innovations come from outside or innovations come from farmers, but outsiders like researchers and research mobile phone companies can innovate with farmers. So they will come together and make new solutions in the ideal world. And um, this is something I observed when I was always asked to put phone numbers into someone's phone. So people can't write or read in these villages where I was working. So I'd think like, so why are you asking me to put the phone number and your friend's name into the phone? Like you can't read it anyway, so how are you going to get it out? Tell me no. Also put like the little symbol. So there's something that Nokia in this case has invented and made part of the, the face of the phone. Um, and you have like a crocodile, a bell, a hat, a flower. So people say, no, I know that Alassane is the crocodile, Rahanati is the bell. So if you just put all the symbols in, I can like use the phone to my own advantage. And this is more important for people who couldn't read and people who could read. Two other things that I noticed that were to me kind of like a synergy between 
phone companies' innovation and the farmers' innovation was, um, well, this idea of um, free night calls, calls to be free in the night time, which I do not like that at all, because if you're calling network to network, you get a lot of phone calls between midnight and 4 a.m. So, but it advantages people who don't have money, so they can make free. The final one, which I think is the most interesting, is um, mobile money. You can put, like, money on your mobile phone and then transfer it to somebody who's got the same network. So, this was really interesting to me because I thought, can this one, is this one going to go towards changing the relationship between technology and those social networks? Could it actually be that you could call up somebody and say that, mm. okay, well, I'm going to send you some money and that one will process the social visit that I might have made like to the chief, for example. I'm not sure about that. So I'm going back in a few days actually to Ghana. And now I've been prompted to do this presentation. I think now these are some of the things that I'm going to be looking out for. The relationship between social visits, mobile phones and so um, I didn't theorise much, it was just ethnographic observations, but I think this is maybe is like the train, the new train of thought for me. So thanks for the